there are a lot of things I could have talked about for this lecture, but I decided to focus it on one thing in particular, and that's going to be self-play. So I'm going to talk about learning to cooperate and compete via self-play. Um, so to start with, um, self-play and two-player zero-sum games. So if you look at a lot of the successes of AI in games, it's usually been due to self-play. So this is like the idea that you have the AI start knowing nothing, um, playing completely from scratch, completely randomly. Um, and then by playing against itself, it gradually improves. And this has led to a lot of famous successes in, uh, in games. For example, uh, AlphaGo, uh, my own work on poker. There's also been work on Dota 2, StarCraft. Um, all of this can be attributed to self-play. Now, when it comes to, I'm going to start by talking about two-player zero-sum games specifically. So in two-player zero-sum games, what are we actually trying to compute? And that's like, uh, uh, it's, it might seem obvious uh, you know, looking, looking back, um, but it's actually like uh, an interesting question that I think we'll actually revisit this later. Um, typically what people assume we want to compute is what's called a minimax equilibrium. So this is um, where each player's strategy is optimal given what the other player is doing. And in a balanced two-player zero-sum game, playing a minimax equilibrium ensures that you will not lose an expectation no matter what your opponent does. Now I'm drawing a distinction here, like, okay, a lot of people say Nash equilibrium. Now in two-player zero-sum games, minimax equilibrium is the same thing as Nash equilibrium. I'm saying minimax because um, I think we should be more careful when we use the term Nash. Um, for example, self-play, does not converge to Nash equilibrium outside of two-player zero-sum games. And I would argue that outside of two-player zero-sum games, Nash equilibrium is not really what we want. So for the, to keep this like more focused on two-player zero-sum games and avoid the risk of generalizing unnecessarily, I'm going to talk about minimax when I talk about two-player zero-sum. Now we're going to measure something called exploitability, which is how much we lose to a worst-case adversary um, that is best responding to our policy. So in a two-player zero-sum game, let's say rock, paper, scissors, let's say our policy is to always throw rock. Then the exploitability, then, then the best response against us is to always throw paper, and so our exploitability is one. Um, okay, let's say we try to get a little bit more tricky. Let's say we throw a rock on the first two rounds, and then if the opponent throws paper for the first two rounds, then we switch it up and we throw scissors on the third round. In this case, the best response against us is to throw paper for the first two rounds and then to throw rock on the third round. And so our exploitability is still one. Um, and that's an exploitability of one because we're losing one point on average every single round. And you might say, well, this is unfair that we're assuming that the opponent knows what our policy is. Um, and this is, this is kind of true. We are actually making, uh, frequently when we're, when we're playing these, uh, these two players zero-sum games, we do make that assumption that our strategy is common knowledge, but the outcomes of random processes are not common knowledge. And the reason why we basically assume that the opponent knows our policy is because if you have something that is interacting with billions of users and they have a lot of time to explore it for weaknesses, then they will uncover weaknesses if they exist. And so rather than trying to hide the weaknesses, um, frequently our goal is to avoid having weaknesses or minimizing the weaknesses in the first place. And the way we can do this is through this, through this second uh, part of the assumption that the outcome, we assume that the outcome of random processes are not common knowledge. So you can kind of think of this as the adversary has access to our code, but not to our random seed. So what we can do in rock, paper, scissors is randomize. If we randomly choose between throwing rock, paper, and scissors with equal probability, then the best response against us, I mean, regardless of what the opponent does, our exploitability is going to be zero. Um, OK, so this guarantees that we're not going to lose an expectation, but it doesn't mean that we're going to win an expectation. In particular, in rock, paper, scissors, it means that we will never win an expectation. Um, but when we go to a more complicated game, like a game like Go or a game like poker, it turns out that even figuring out how to best respond to a minimax equilibrium is really difficult. And so by playing minimax, we are guaranteeing that we're not going to lose an expectation. And our opponent is probably going to make weaknesses, uh, is probably going to make mistakes that in the long run will lead to us winning. And in fact, if you look at strategy guides for poker, this is usually what they recommend. They say, uh, there's this one, this is one guy that says, for example, poker is simple, as your opponent makes mistakes, you profit. So the idea is, play the minimax equilibrium, let your opponent make mistakes, and every time they make a mistake, you're profiting off of that. Because every time they lose money, you're making money. Any questions so far? Also, I'm happy to take questions throughout the talk. Um, it doesn't have to be until the end. Yeah? When you're fully maximizing, you can't affect your opponent's mistakes. In, in, in rock, paper, scissors, yes. I'm using rock, paper, scissors as a very simple example. But if you're playing a game like poker, 
Um, if you're playing the Nash equilibrium, then your opponent could still choose actions that have negative expected value. And if an opponent chooses an action that has negative expected value, then that is positive expected value for you. Okay. Yeah? In multiplayer games, does min max still be rolled to be able to make zero spread? No. Um, outside of two player zero sum games, um, minimax is not a very useful solution concept. Um, we'll talk about what is reasonable in multiplayer games later, um, but it is, it is an important question. That's right. That, that is what we're doing in Minimax. And so that, that raises, that gets to that, the original question that I asked, which is what are we actually trying to do in a two-player zero-sum game? Now, it doesn't have to be Minimax. You could argue that, for example, in poker, there, there's two things you could, you could aim for. One is to be unbeatable, like you are the best, like, what, what does it mean to be the best poker player in the world? Like, one argument is if you were to go head-to-head -head against any other poker player and play for a million hands, you would not lose to them. You would, probably, you would beat them. Another argument is the best poker player in the world is the one that makes the most money every year. Now, there's not a right answer there. You could make the most money every year but still lose to the guy that is, is, un, is unbeatable, right? Like maybe the guy that's unbeatable is just taking very little money off of weak players, whereas you're really good at exploiting the weak players. Um, so there's no right or wrong answer. Typically in two player zero sum games, what we measure is being unbeatable. And the, for example, if you look at Go AIs, like what we're actually measuring is like, does this, does this bot lose to anybody else? We're not looking at like, you know, does it do a better job of avoiding ties and, and winning against weak players? Um, and this is where it gets interesting once we go outside of two-player zero-sum games. Because outside of two-player zero-sum games, there is no useful minimax. I mean, there is a minimax, but it's not useful anymore. There's no way to guarantee that you're unbeatable. And so the other solution concept now looks a lot more appealing. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this like exploitation thing a little bit later. Any other questions? OK. Um, so in two player zero sum perfect information games, self-play is basically just running independent single agent RL. Um, you can just do, have each player do PPO. Um, as long as your exploration is positive, you will eventually, in theory at least, converge to the minimax equilibrium. Now, in practice, this isn't exactly true because of limitations of neural nets and all that. Um, but it, it's actually pretty straightforward in, in perfect information games. Now that said, uh, there are still, it is still possible to be vulnerable to adversarial attacks. Um, in fact, there was recent work out of Berkeley that showed um, that superhuman Go policies could be exploited um, using actually human implementable uh, strategies. So you know, if you like basically train a best response against uh, a Go AI, a superhuman Go AI, you can uncover a way to beat it, which that, that alone isn't, isn't surprising. Like this is, you know, of, of course this is the case, like this is how the AI is trained in the first place, so if you just like focus in on beating a particular policy, it's going to learn it, it's going to learn how to beat it. What's really interesting is that this policy is, is like simple enough that a human can actually implement it and themselves beat the AI. Um, and this is due to a few things, it, like one for example is that neural nets um, are limited in their capacity and they're, they're limited in their ability to pro approximate a minimax equilibrium. Um, another is that in general it's easier to find an exploit than to defend against all exploits. Um, and this is actually especially true in imperfect information games. So, um, you know, there are ways to mitigate this. Um, we'll talk about uh, fictitious play soon. But just keep in mind that this is an issue. It's less of an issue in perfect information games, but it's still an issue. Now, when we go to imperfect information games, things get uh, even harder. Um, Surprisingly, a lot of people don't realize this, but if you were to just run PPO, like independent PPO, in rock, paper, scissors, like um, a modified version of rock, paper, scissors, so that the equilibrium is not just one third, one third, one third, uh, it actually doesn't converge to the minimax equilibrium. It will actually just like cycle endlessly, and even if you take the average over all of the, over all the cycles, it will not converge to the, to the minimax equilibrium. Um, so yeah, independent, and th this is like, I think, a, one of the important things to take away from this talk. If you just run independent RL, independent naive PPO or whatever, um, in a game like Rock, Paper, Scissors, it will not converge to the minimax equilibrium. Uh, and this is even more true if you look at larger information games, but it's true even for Rock, Paper, Scissors. 
Um, so this is, for example, a, a, a plot showing if you were to run independent PPO, what is the expected value of the policy that you get? Like, if, like how close are you to Nash equilibrium? And you see it's never actually getting to zero, just like going up and down. Um, OK, any questions about that? A lot of people find this surprising. They don't really teach this in classes. Yeah? Are there ways to fix this? Yes, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, yeah? Can I just clarify when you said independent PPO, there's only one player, right? Mm -hmm. it, it learns if it's a fixed opponent. Or no, no, so I'm saying like if you have both players play PPO against each other, oh, okay. and so they're starting, you know, random and they're trying to converge. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah? Is there an operation on Bob? Yes, I will talk about that on the next slide. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, rock, paper, scissors has this, like, very convenient property that the equilibrium is to just do, like, the uniform random thing. And so, like, a lot of things will end up converging in rock, paper, scissors because they will just converge to uniform random. Um, but, you know, if you make the equilibrium something, like, a little bit more complicated, like 40%, 20%, 20%, then 40%, um, 40%, 20%, then it will, you, you, it's easier to see that it just doesn't converge. Yeah. Like, one, we, one easy way to make an algorithm converge in regular rock, paper, scissors is to just set the temperature to infinity, and then, you know, you're essentially getting uniform. Okay. So what's the intuition for why this doesn't work? All right, so let's say we're, we have this, like, sequential version of rock, paper, scissors. It's a little bit easier to see. This is, a, um, it's called rock, paper, scissors plus. This is identical to rock, paper, scissors, except if either player plays scissors, then the winner receives two points and the loser loses two points. So, um, and, and I'm showing a sequential version of this game where player one acts first, and then player two um, acts after player one without observing what player one did. And so that's why there are these dotted lines between the player two nodes. Um, and so you can see, for example, um, if player one chooses rock and then player two chooses scissors, then player one receives a payoff of two and player two receives a payoff of minus two. So I'm only showing the payoffs for player one because this is a two player zero sum game. So player two just receives the opposite. Um, okay, and, and keep in mind, player two is not observing what player one did. So this is just a, a sequential uh, description of, of regular rock, paper, scissors. So the equilibrium in this game is to randomize equally, um, is to randomize equally, uh, not equally, sorry. It's to play rock with 40% probability, scissors, paper with 40% probability, and scissors with 20% probability. So if you do the math, you can actually compute that this is a Nash equilibrium. Uh, for example, if player one plays rock with, uh, Okay, so let's say uh, player two plays paper. What is their expected value? 40% of the time, they get a payoff of one. 40% of the time, they get a payoff of zero. 20% of the time, they get a payoff of minus two. So if you add that up, it, it average, it's, on average, it's zero. And for all these actions, the expected value is zero. And so that means that it's a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so what happens if you look at the, uh, the Q values for player, for player one? They're all zero. And why, why is that a problem? Well, if you're running a, like a typical naive RL algorithm that is you know, basing its policy on the Q values, then there's no reason why it will choose 40%, 40%, 20% probability. Right? It, it, it's reasonable for it to choose one third, one third, one third, or a random policy. But those aren't the Nash equilibrium. You need it to play specifically 40%, 40%, 20%. So there's just like. The algorithms that are used in single agent RL are not designed to converge to a, to a mixed policy, a particular mixed policy. Um, they're designed to find the action that has the highest expected value and then play that action. And you can see that this is like a problem because let's say the, the algorithm does decide to do, uh, for example, let's say 80% uh, rock, 10% paper, 10% scissors then the expected values for these actions are going to change, right? If you're playing rock with 80% probability, then the opponent's policy is not going to be to randomize, uh, is not going to be to play the Nash equilibrium. It's going to be to play paper all the time. And because of that, the expected value of rock is going to decrease. It's going to go from zero to minus one. So fundamentally, the reason why uh, perfect information, uh, self-play, and single agent RL algorithms don't work in imperfect information games is because the value of an action is dependent on the probability that it is chosen. That is not true in single agent RL or perfect information games. It is true in, imp in imperfect information games. For example, in chess, 
if you decide to open with the Sicilian defense, the expected value is not going to change depending on if you do it 10% of the time or 100% of the time. It's going to have the same expected value in the equilibrium, in, in under perfect play regardless. But in poker, if you were to bluff, like bluffing might be a good action, but if you always bluff, then the value of bluffing is going to go down because the players, the, the opponent is going to adjust their strategy to respond to that. And in rock, paper, scissors, you know, you want to sometimes play rock, but if you're always playing rock, then the value of playing rock is going to decrease. Um, and, and so you, that's, that's the, the challenge that you don't run into in, imper in perfect information games or single agent RL. Any questions about that? The partially observable Markov decision process. So POM DPs are like a single uh, a single agent setting, uh, and so there, it's also fine to have an algorithm that just chooses the max expected value action all the time, because like there's no opponent that's going to. It's not like the the environment is adversarial, and is going to adjust in response to your policy. Um, yeah, like there's. A, she's asking about multi agent POM DPs. Oh, a multi agent POM DPs. So I would say that multi-agent POMDPs are, you know, basically a subset of imperfect information games. Um, and so I think that the same problem happens there. Uh, I think it depends on the setup. Yeah. But like, do you have a particular well, setup? It's big and complicated enough. You can actually be deterministic and still approximate between, uh, you know, your distribution responses. Like if you just, you know, you see, you know, a little pixel somewhere in your, in your vision uh, is different and that causes you to, to randomize. If you lose environmental randomness, it's still a deterministic algorithm. I'm not, I'm not saying that, yeah, you could have a deterministic algorithm. Actually, this is like an interesting quirk of imperfect information games. If, like, in poker, the policies tend to be quite pure. Um, and in fact, the more possible hands that you can have, the more pure the policies end up being. But that doesn't mean that you can run a single agent RL algorithm. Um, because, you, like the the important thing is that you're able to randomize. Um, like in order to find that pure policy, you need to um, be able to a, a account for these kinds of problems. Um, and the the reason why you can have a very pure policy in a game like poker, if there is sufficient hidden information, is because from your opponent's perspective, like they don't know what you're conditioning on, and so from their perspective, it appears random. Like you know, if I decide to randomize based on um, you know the second hand of my of my watch then that's a deterministic policy, but for my opponent who doesn't see my watch, it appears random. Um, so yeah, so that, that, you're right that, it, yeah, you can have pure policies, but it doesn't mean that you can run single agent RL. Um, other questions? Yeah? Uh, how does the, what you described here mesh with the earlier statement that you, um, for two players, there's some game you're eventually going to converge to the situation? Um, if you run the right algorithm, yes. <laughs> so if you, if you use a, a self-play algorithm that is guaranteed to converge to the minimax equilibrium, then, then eventually you'll get there. So just running independent uh, single agent RL um, doesn't necessarily get you there. There are other algorithms that I'll cover in a second that, that do guarantee you'll get there. And so the core thing about this algorithm that uh, violates the earlier statement is the fact that you're centering it on your two values. Well, it, depend, it depends on the algorithm that you run. So, there are certain algorithms that are guaranteed to converge to a minimax equilibrium. There are many more algorithms that, there are some algorithms that will converge to a minimax equilibrium in perfect information games. Um, there are others, but, but won't converge in, in an imperfect information game. There is a smaller subset that will converge in both imperfect information and perfect information games. So yeah, there are different kinds of self-play algorithms. Um, and I'll, I'll cover the ones that that do have guarantees for both settings. Yeah? Uh, quick question on your question. Do you think this particular approach when you use two values, obviously it's not converted to match equilibrium, but is that stable? And in terms of cyclic behavior, what it kind of revolves around? No. In fact, if you take the average over all the policies, it's still not going to be Nash equilibrium or minimax equilibrium. I mean, it doesn't have to match the Nash equilibrium, but is it like the same set of policies that it made? Um, what do you mean by the same set of policies? It mean like they does it cycle through a whole bunch of same policies that they like to stick to as stable points, but they don't actually end up converging all these same directions. Um, so in in rock paper scissors, I guess all the actions are like valid, reasonable strategies to play. Um, 
And so it will, it will cycle among the support of the equilibrium. Um, there, I don't think that there's guarantees in general for what it will do. Yeah, okay. Yep. Um, just talking about the imperfect information model, is it, is it not due to the cyclical nature of this parity? Whereas, okay, chess, you move alternately rather than simultaneously, but there's no cyclical strategy that allows you to do the same as this. That not be Um, I think that's certainly a factor, yes. Um, I mean, again, like in imperfect information games, you can't have pure policies. And so it's not just that you have to randomize necessarily. Um, but yeah, the fact that there is this kind of like, yeah, there, there, there could be imperfect information games where you can, like just because they're not very complicated, and you end up just like always doing the, this one, a single right action. Um, if you run independent PPO, it could potentially converge to a minimax equilibrium. Um, but in general, you can't, you can't rely on that. And I think for the interesting imperfect information games, you can't rely on that. Yeah, any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so how do we get around this? Well, there's actually a lot of solutions to this problem. Um, one that has kind of like been repeatedly discovered, and I feel like there's this like trend where Every year, there's a multi-agent RL paper where somebody rediscovers fictitious play. Um, this, this is a, an idea that's been around since like 1951. Um, and it's actually a very simple intuitive algorithm. So you start by initializing the strat each player's policy um, totally randomly. And then on each iteration, you compute a best response to the average of uh, the, pr the player's strategy over all the previous iterations. So you kind of like think of it as, um, Imagine you have PPO in like this inner loop and you have this outer loop of like trying to best respond to all the previous PPO policies. So to give you some intuition for this, like let's say we're playing rock, paper, scissors. Um, on iteration one, we initialize both players' policies to let's just say like throwing rock. So on iteration one, both players are gonna throw rock. On iteration two, the players are going to compute the policy that best responds to the previous iteration's policy. So in, in the previous iteration, they were throwing rock. So on iteration two, their policy is going to be, well, I should, throw paper. And so now they're going to update their policy to be the average of um, iteration one and iteration two, so half rock, half paper. On iteration three, they're going to compute the best response to the policy of one half rock, one half paper. Uh, so the best response to that is to throw paper. Uh, and so now they're going to update their policy to be two thirds paper, one third rock. On iteration four, you compute a best response to that previous policy. So the, the best response to two thirds paper, one third rock is to throw scissors. And so now you update your policy to be one quarter rock, two quarters paper, one quarter scissors. And if you iterate this process, you will eventually converge to the Nash equilibrium. This is proven. Um, very, very simple algorithm, uh, very, very effective. And there's been a lot of like, I, I wouldn't say it's just like people are purely rediscovering fictitious play, but there's like a lot of like modifications. And if you look at um, things like regret minimization, hedge, um, counterfactual regret minimization, things like the Nash League, uh, policy space response oracle, at their core, they are all doing something similar to fictitious play. Um, so this is a very powerful idea. Any questions about this? OK. Now, there are um, modifications of fictitious play, um, regret matching, and hedge. They're, if you look at them carefully, they're actually doing something similar to fictitious play. So regret matching and hedge, um, OK, fictitious play is always computing a best response to the um, opponent's average policy over all the previous iterations. What regret matching and hedge are doing is they're picking a regularized best response. So um, re what regret matching is going to do is it's saying instead of, you know, in this case, if, these, if this is the expected value of rock, this is the expected value of paper, this is the expected value of scissors, fictitious play is just going to say, well, paper, uh, the expected value against the previous policies of the opponents. Paper is going to say, uh, Fictitious play is going to say, well, paper has the highest expected value, so my policy for this iteration is going to be paper. Regret matching is going to say, let me draw this line, which is um, the expected value that I have gotten over all the previous iterations. Um, anything above this line, I'm going to renormalize to one, and that's going to be my policy. So that's regret matching. Um, hedge is arguably even simpler. It's just doing a softmax of a best response, uh, softmax best response. So it's doing e to the uh, utility of the actions times some um, temperature parameter. 
And these help you converge faster. Uh, and they, they do still guarantee that you, you converge to equilibrium. Um, if, for in the case of hedge, the temperature has to be a certain schedule. Yep? With, with the name fictitious play, what's the intuition behind why is it called fictitious? There's not a good reason for why it's called fictitious play. I think it's actually poorly named, but you know, it, it was the 50s, it was a different time. <laughs> I think the reason actually was that it was meant as an algorithm for computing uh, equilibria rather than an iterative true process. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the thing was like, I'm going to imagine what would happen if we played this many times, and I'm going to use that to play the first time. I think that was sort of the idea behind it, which then ironically it actually became more a learning algorithm. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions? Fictitious play is a particular kind of self-play. Um, again, this is why I feel like it's poorly named, because like fictitious play sounds a lot like self-play, but they're actually two different algorithms. Like self-play, it's kind of like ill-defined, but it's basically like any time you have two agents playing against each other using the same algorithm, um, or more than two agents. Um, fictitious play is like a particular algorithm that I just described. Which is the best responding. Yeah, it's like the best responding to all the, the, the opponent's average over all the previous iterations. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's yeah. Self play is like a very general term. Okay. Um, there's also uh, okay. So I talked about regret matching and uh, and hedge. So we actually like regret matching was at the core of our uh, uh, our work on AI for poker um, in 2017. We made an AI using counterfactual regret minimization that played against four top ends up no limit poker pros, um, and ended up beating them by about four standard deviations of statistical significance. Um, one thing that's really interesting about this work that I think is particularly relevant, is particularly important as we talk about exploitability, is that we didn't just play a small number of hands against these players. We actually played 120,000 hands over the course of 20 days. And during that time, the players were actively trying to look for weaknesses in the bot strategy. So they would get together at the end of each day and would strategize about like, how they would explore the game tree for potential weaknesses in the bot strategy. And we actually gave them a list at the end of each day of all the hands that were played and the, what cards the bot had on those hands. So they, they actually had more information than they usually do against uh, a human opponent. Um, and despite that, they were not able to um, exploit the bot effectively. So I think this shows the power of these like regret minimization techniques that are guaranteed to converge to minimax equilibrium in, in a sound way. Um, also, just like a, an interesting footnote, it didn't use any deep, deep learning. Um, this is kind of surprising to a lot of people. The, the most recent versions of like these poker AIs do use deep learning, um, but I think at its core, poker was an interesting challenge for AI, not because of like the feature representation aspect, but because um, because of the imperfect information aspect and the, the inability of these traditional RL algorithms to converge to equilibrium in an efficient way in poker. Yep, question? Oh, yeah? Hey, sorry, just to connect with this to the previous slide, uh, so if you use fictitious self-play with a TPO learning algorithm, would you, uh, in the previous setup, would you learn the, the correct payoff? Or would you still have the same failure mode but the value function? So you're saying use fictitious, fictitious play with PPO? Yeah. Like PPO right. is in the inner loop? Yes. The then yes, you, you, would, you would converge. You would converge very slowly. So I would not recommend running that in poker. Um, like that, that's, that's why hedge and regret matching are usually preferable to fictitious play, because fictitious play is guaranteed to converge to equilibrium. But in, in larger games, the larger the game is, the slower it's going to converge. And it can be very, very slow, especially in a game like poker. But these like regularized versions like regret matching converge much faster. No, they will be zero, 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 but the idea is that they're going to like slightly cycle around zero, 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 and then because you're taking the average over all the previous iterations, it's the average over all the previous iterations that's going to converge to the equilibrium. OK, okay any other questions? Yeah, so one thing I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but like in fictitious play, it's not the final iteration that converges to the Nash equilibrium or the minimax equilibrium. It is actually the average over all of the iterations that converges.
Okay, um, limitations of fixtures display, regret matching, hedge. So one major issue is that they actually get pretty poor performance in single agent RL alg algorithms. Um, there's a few reasons for this. One is that you know, the first iteration is always gonna be random. And you know, because you're taking the average over all the iterations, um, it, it's just in general going to converge slower than, um, than single agent RL. And especially because like, the policy that you're responding to is also the average over all the iterations. So you're kind of like updating your opponent slower. Uh, and so because of that, you're, you're just like learning slower. Um, the other issue is that as the environment grows in size, the number of iterations that you need to converge, it grows a lot as well. So if you're looking at like complicated 3D environments, like a soccer shootout, for example, uh, penalty kick, you could need many, many iterations to converge to equilibrium. Um, and there really, there's been some work trying to develop algorithms that are able to work in these kinds of like environments and get good performance in traditional single agent RL algorithms. You do converge eventually, but it is a lot slower. Yeah? Is that slowness partly because it's hard to compute a best response for these larger games? Uh, it's not, no, I don't think that's the issue. Maybe that is part of the issue, but I think the real issue is that because the action space is so large, like every time you you like become robust to one best response, like it's just really easy to have like other weaknesses that open up and it's hard to be robust to all of them. And so you get into this like cycle of like just constantly spotting weaknesses and, um, and, and opening up new ones. Now there has been interesting work trying to address this issue. Um, it is actually I think a good research topic, but um, it hasn't really been addressed yet. Um, Yeah, but I think the, com the comparison. Get slower and slower. Yes, but I think the problem is that the comparison to single agent R algorithms becomes like increasingly worse. So if you were to compare re fictitious play, regret matching, or hedge to single agent R algorithms in a, in a single agent setting, then you get very poor, very poor performance. Uh, now, there has been recent work that has actually made a lot of progress on this. Um, so this is recent work, um, two similar papers, one on regularized Nash dynamics and the other on magnetic mirror descent. Um, these algorithms, I won't go into detail about how they work, but um, they're worth looking into if you're interested in this topic. They actually get very good performance in single agent RL algorithms, uh, in single agent RL settings, uh, performance that is comparable to PPO, while still converging to equilibrium in imperfect information games. Now, I should caveat that by saying they converge uh, a lot slower in imperfect information games, and they're actually not guaranteed to converge. Nobody's proven that they're guaranteed to converge in, in, in imperfect information two-player zero-sum games. Um, at least not sequential two-player zero-sum games. Um, but empirically they do, and, um, and that's actually like quite impressive, I think. Um, and also these are relatively new algorithms, and so it's quite possible that with further improvements, uh, they could become competitive with things like, like counterfactual regret minimization, uh, and all these state-of-the-art algorithms that have been used in things like poker. Um, okay, now I want to switch gears. Any questions before I switch gears to the general sum games? Okay, so I'm gonna have a, a slightly spicy take uh, and say the main takeaway from this section is going to be that learning to cooperate with humans without using human data is a dead end. Um, and I'm going to hopefully justify that claim, but feel free to push back if you disagree. So I want to start by talking about diplomacy because I'm going to use this as a running example. Um, diplomacy is this game. Uh, it's a seven-player. Um, it's a seven-player game, zero-sum game actually. But we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later. How it's actually there's a difference between two-player zero-sum and everything else. And so when you have a seven-player zero-sum game, you still have a lot of cooperation. Um, an example of this would be if you've seen the movie Hunger Games. It is ultimately a zero-sum game, but the players still manage to work together for at least part of the time. Um, it is a popular strategy game developed in the 1950s. It was actually JFK and Kissinger's favorite game. Um, and it, it models like the alliance structure that existed prior to World War I. So you have all these like different countries with like uh, secret alliances, and um, you actually play one of the seven great powers of Europe leading up to World War I. And, um, there's a big emphasis on negotiation with other players. So each turn involves private natural language negotiation. You actually spend between like five and 15 minutes talking to other players one-on-one. -on -one. All these conversations are private. Um, and you conspire about like how, you know, you want to form an alliance with them and work with them and attack this other person. Um, 
And then after you've done all these negotiations, everybody writes down their moves, and the moves are executed simultaneously. So you can say, for example, I'm going to move my fleet in uh, Clyde to the Norwegian Sea, so on and so on. Um, but because all the actions are executed simultaneously, you can promise somebody that you're going to do something and then not actually follow through. And so this is a big aspect of the game. There's a, lot of, there's a big emphasis on trust and being able to uh, know if you can trust somebody, being able to convince them that they can trust you. Um, and alliances are really key. It's really not possible to win the game of diplomacy just through tactics alone. You have to be able to form alliances in order to succeed in this game. Um, and it was long considered a challenge problem for AI. Uh, there's actually research going back into the 1980s on this game, um, but it was considered basically intractable back then. Uh, research really picked up in 2019 with work from Mila, DeepMind, uh, FAIR, and others. Okay, so I'm, gonna, like, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to try to go through this quickly. But basically, like, the way diplomacy works, what makes it interesting is that if two units try to move into the same territory, then they're actually going to bounce each other, and they're both going to go back to where they started. Now, one unit can support another unit into that territory, and that's what you're seeing in this, uh, in this second picture here. And in that case, it's a two versus one. And so that unit, unit, that unit in Budapest is going to move into Galatia successfully. And what's really important is that you can actually get support from another power. So for example, the green player here can support the red player into Galatia, and that will also succeed. And so like, the red player might want to talk to the green player and try to convince them to support them into that territory, either offer something in return or try to convince them that it's in their interest to support them into that territory. Um, but of course, you could promise people things and then not follow through. And so for that reason, diplomacy has the reputation of the game that ruins friendships. And it's actually, you know, it's really true. Uh, it's a very difficult to <laughs> game to play with your friends. It's just really difficult. Like People go into it thinking, oh, it's just a game. It's going to be fine. But, you know, it's like a six-hour game. And so you're sitting there with people for like four hours, having this really good working relationship with them. You think you're going to win this game. And then suddenly they backstab you and totally ruin your game. And, you know, that, it's just really emotionally difficult to, to, uh, to, to deal with that. Um, but if you talk to top diplomacy players, they, they really don't see it as a game about backstabbing and betrayal. They see it as a game about trust. There's this great quote from Andrew Goff, who's a three-time world diplomacy champion, where he says that diplomacy is ultimately, ultimately about building trust in an environment that encourages you to not trust anyone. And I think that's, that's really significant because it's really easy to build trust in an environment where nobody has an incentive to be, you know, to, to be dishonest. It's another thing to be able to establish trust in an environment where players have, a, have an incentive to you know, betray. OK, so that's the motivation for diplomacy. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on what's called no press diplomacy. This is, we're going to take out the private natural language communication uh, between the players. So we're only going to look at the moves executed in the game. Um, you might think that that removes like, a big aspect of diplomacy, and it's true, it does. But, um, but it's still, alliances and coordination are still a big factor, even if you remove the language. Um, because there are, there's kind of like implicit communication in the moves, itself, in the moves themselves. And we're going to do this because it's much easier to analyze what's going on from a self-play game theoretic standpoint um, if we look at this more simplified version. Yep? So you cannot ask another power to support you. You can't ask another power to support you through natural language. You can kind of like signal it through your moves. Like maybe, you know, if you issue a support order for, um, for a unit and it doesn't go through, then the other player will kind of like recognize, like, oh, you tried to help me, so I'm going to like try to do that move again this turn. Um, so there's kind of like, uh, yeah, there, there is like language, but it's just not natural language. Um, OK, so we actually made an AI for this leading up to our uh, work on Cicero, which played the full natural language version. And our agent ultimately achieved expert level performance in this version of the game. OK, so what is interesting about no press diplomacy? So the first thing we tried to do. Um, is make an AI that plays a two-player version of no press diplomacy. So there is a variant of the game called France versus Austria, where there's only two powers. And it is essentially two-player zero-sum diplomacy. And we trained an, an AI from scratch in this game. And there were actually interesting challenges because the action space is like extremely large. Um, but we developed this algorithm called Dora. And 
it ultimately uh, achieved a win rate of about 86.5% against uh, top human players. Now, there, this is a game of chance. Like, there is a big luck component in this game. So the fact that we are able to win 86.5% of the time means that we're clearly superhuman. Anything above 50% would be superhuman. Um, yeah? Where did the luck come from in this? It's kind of like in Rock, Paper, Scissors, how there's luck. You know, because it's a simultaneous move game, you have to randomize. And, and so you might just get unlucky in, in what, what action you draw. Um, Okay, what's interesting about this, so we took this algorithm, very successful in, in the two-player zero-sum version of diplomacy. We then ran it in the seven-player version of diplomacy. So we trained it completely from scratch with no human data, started by playing totally randomly, and converged to a policy. We ran it for a very long time. Um, and this is what we found, and it's really interesting. Um, this table shows, um, these are different versions of diplomacy AIs. So Dora is the one that we trained from scratch using DeepRL. Um, SearchBot is a, a previous paper of ours. D DipNet is a pure supervised learning agent, so it just takes a lot of human data and does supervised learning on it. Um, and uh, this, this is like a modification of Dora that initializes from, from DipNet rather than from scratch. So what we found is that if you take, uh, okay, so if we take SearchBot, which was the, pro the previous strongest bot in diplomacy, one copy of SearchBot playing against six copies of Dora, SearchBot only wins 1% of the time. Now, this is a seven-player game. So if you are, so like tying would be 14%. So the fact that it was only winning 1% of the time means that it was clearly losing when playing with six copies of Dora. But if we take one copy of Dora and play it against six copies of SearchBot, Dora only wins 11% of the time. So Dora is losing when it's playing with six copies of SearchBot. So what's happening here? Basically, this is evidence that Dora is computing, it's, it's probably getting close to a Nash equilibrium, but it's getting close to a particular Nash equilibrium, and diplomacy is this game where there are multiple Nash equilibria. And so it does really, like, what is a Nash equilibrium? A Nash equilibrium guarantees that you will do as well as possible when playing with other people that are playing the same Nash equilibrium. So if you take six copies of Dora and have them play together, they're going to do quite well with each other. But if you just take one copy of Dora, stick it in a game with six other players that are playing some other random, like arbitrary Nash equilibrium or not Nash equilibrium, there's no guarantee that Dora is going to do well. So this is evidence that diplomacy has multiple Nash equilibria. Um, Dora is converging to one, I shouldn't even say Nash equilibrium. It's, technically, it's not converging to a Nash equilibrium necessarily, but you know, in practice, it, gets, it does pretty well. Um, it's converging to one equilibrium. But that doesn't mean that it's going to play well when you stick it in a game with, uh, with other arbitrary players. Um, any questions about this? Yeah? Uh, it, it's a very chaotic one. It's very, it's very foreign from how humans play the game. Uh, if, you, if you look at how it's playing, it's just really weird oh, from so a human perspective. Equilibrium concept. I oh. You said not Nash because it was like correlated equilibrium. It, it's, it's technically coarse correlated equilibrium. Yeah, but in practice, it, it does, if you look empirically, it converges pretty close to Nash equilibrium. Yeah. Other questions? OK. So maybe you're not convinced by this. Let me, let me give you a more convincing example that will hope. So OK, what, what does this mean? What this means is that just running DeepRL from scratch with no human data is not going to get your, your bot to play well in a game with humans. Um, so. Let me give a, a more concrete example of this to, to really prove this point. Um, how many of you know about the ultimatum game? Do we, can I get like $100 to like play this game with some participants? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I should have asked that ahead of time, sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, Alice, let's, the way the ultimatum game works is Alice is given $100, and Alice must offer Bob between zero and $100, and then after that, Bob must decide whether to accept or reject. If Bob accepts, then Alice and Bob keep their money, if Bob rejects, then Alice and Bob get nothing. So um, does anybody know what the, what's the Nash equilibrium for this game? Anybody want to say? Accept anything. Accept anything. Offer $1. Offer $1. Yeah, so there's actually, there's actually two Nash equilibria, which is interesting. One is for Alice to offer $1 and for Bob to accept. The other one is for um, Alice to offer $0 and for Bob to accept, which is kind of like a quirk. I think there might be others as well. Is there um, something weird like... Something like uh, Alice offers zero and Bob rejects is also an Bob rejects everything is also an Nash equilibrium. Anyway, there's, there are so 
yeah, the, the equilibrium that people typically think of and that in AI, if we were to play, would probably converge to um, would be Alice offering $1 and Bob accepting. Um, but of course, if you would actually play this with humans, and there's been a lot of experiments that, that show this, they don't end up accepting $1. Um, if they are offered anything less than usually about 20%, um, they will reject. So there's two attitudes we could take to this. One is to say, like, okay, well, the humans are the problem. Um, and, you know, it's their fault that they're not doing what the math says that they should do. Um, the other perspective is that, well, maybe we should be rethinking the way we run these algorithms. Um, now, you might even say, like, well, maybe we can get our algorithms to converge to this, like, 20% offer rate through some, like, clever regularization or something. But to take one step further, this this threshold of what people are willing to accept or reject is culturally dependent. So if you go to different cultures, they will have different thresholds for what they consider to be a reasonable offer. And so there's no way that you're going to get an AI to learn how to play this well with humans from scratch with no human data. It's, it's impossible. Um, any questions about that? Yeah? For the iterative game? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about that. Probably you could achieve some, some level of cooperation if it's like yeah. uh, infinitely repeated. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, and so this gets back to the question that was asked earlier about like, okay, what is what does optimal actually really mean? Like, are we really trying to aim for minimax equilibrium and two player zero sum? And two player zero sum, I think minimax is an equal is a, is a reasonable thing to aim for. But once you go outside of two player zero sum, then minimax is no longer a useful solution concept. And so the question is, like, what are we actually trying to do? I would argue that Nash equilibrium is not what we want. What we really want, arguably, is that we want our agent to maximize utility um, given the population of players. And that requires some belief distribution about the population of players. And if we want this AI to play with humans, then that means it requires human data. Um, and you can think of language as the ultimate uh, human convention. And so, like, if you want, I think, I think a very clear-cut example is, like, if you want an AI to play diplomacy, like full natural language diplomacy, the idea that you can get it to learn to play that completely from scratch with no human data is, is kind of silly, right? How is it going to learn to speak English? If it plays from scratch, uh, learns from scratch, it's going to learn to speak some weird robot language that is not going to be able to negotiate with humans. Okay, so you might look at this and say, like, well, self-play from... Self-play RL from scratch has been tremendously successful in a lot of games. Like, how do we explain that? Well, if you look at things like Go, Poker, um, you know, these kinds of environments, they were all in two-player zero-sum games. And so Deep RL from scratch works really well. Like, self-play RL from scratch in these environments do really well because they are two-player zero-sum, and what we're trying to compute there is a minimax equilibrium. Um, there's also been some work in things like um, Dota 2, uh, capture the flag, hide and seek, where salt play RL from scratch has also been very successful. But these are in two team zero sum games, and strategically these are equivalent to two player zero sum, uh, with some asterisk as attached to that, which I won't go into. But in these in these games, it is actually effectively two player zero sum. Um, now, interestingly, salt play RL has also been shown to be reasonably successful in cooperative games. Uh, two-player cooperative games like Hanabi and like Overcooked. But I would argue that there's two reasons for this. One is, um, in a two-player fully cooperative game, humans can adapt to the bot. So if you train a bot completely from scratch with no human data, it's going to learn to play a policy that's not very compatible with humans, but the humans are adaptable and they will be able to adapt to the bot. So that's not going to be true when you go beyond two players. If you have, like, for example, a seven-player game like Diplomacy, the humans are just going to prefer to work with each other rather than this weird bot that's doing weird things um, that it can't understand. Um, and also, in these, in, in these games, they've, I would argue that they've been small enough that you can effectively encode human knowledge in the algorithms themselves. And that's not going to be the case as we scale to, to more complicated domains. Yep? Is there a point that we cannot do, kind of like learn to cooperate with humans with, uh, without human data from scratch at all? Like in principle, or like sort of more like we can't do it efficiently? I mean, you could always encode Human, essentially you can encode human data by handcrafting the algorithm to have the data in it. And I would argue that like, if you look at some of these papers that are trying to achieve human cooperation from scratch, uh, 
that's essentially what they're doing. They're trying to encode the human conventions into the algorithms themselves. That is not scalable because, you know, humans are complex, and and that's the lesson from machine learning that like, you know, you want something that scales well with complexity and and, and um, if we go to more complicated environments, it's just not realistic to be able to encode human conventions into that. You're much better off trying to learn those human conventions from human data. You want to follow up to that, or? Yeah. So, so you're saying that things like the play, they are like actually a form of human biases for encoding. Uh, yeah. I, would, I don't want to like point to a specific work, but like, yeah, I think I think that would be like an example. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Would you say there's a third way where if you can elicit the human data at test time? and the environment is such that maybe you don't need a large amount of it, at training time you might be able to construct a population from scratch um, according to some evolutionary process which doesn't have many biases. If it can cover the space such that you can meta that. But then how do you cover the space? That's the question. So like an example is language. Like, you, know, you could say, like, well, I'm going to develop an algorithm that's going to be able to adapt to the population of players that I encounter at test time. But how do you make an AI that can adapt to any possible language that it encounters at test time? That's, that's not realistic. And like, you know, there's English, um, but it's not going like to learn English on, at test time when it's playing with a bunch of humans. Well, I guess I can go to a different country where I don't speak the language. Maybe they're just using sign language, right? Uh -huh. But something about the way in which the environment in which I've grown up um, and the fact that maybe I've had other kind of interactions means that I can get by in that place, even if yeah. I don't worry. That's true, but that's because human languages tend to be structurally similar to each other. Um, and so you're essentially relying on human data at that point. You're relying on the human data that you've grown up with to then generalize to this test time environment. So like learning from scratch, though, is very different. Or I'm relying on the uh, evolutionary process that has produced it. I think we're able to quibbling about where human data is, but it depends how much yeah. you believe that because of the regularities just in the world we live in and the evolutionary process, or whether that's the regularities in my upbringing. Possibly, I, yeah. I, I, I would lean towards it being the human data, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, um, and finally, one more example. So I actually had uh, success recently, like a few years ago, in six-player poker. Six-player poker, interestingly, is not a two-player zero-sum game. We did it completely through RL, uh, self-play RL from scratch with no human data. Um, but I would argue that this was the case because six-player poker there's no room for cooperation, and so essentially it's very similar to a two-player zero-sum game despite having six players in it. So um, you, you have to look at more than just the technical definition of is this a two-player zero-sum game or not. You have to like, these, these, whether self-play RL from scratch is going to do well really depends on the dynamics of the game. Um, and I would argue a big part of it is how much cooperation there is in the game. Okay, so given that I'm arguing against self-play RL from scratch, um, what should we do instead? Well, a reasonable alternative is to go all, all the way in the other direction and say we're just going like, to rely purely on human data and uh, do behavioral cloning. So collect a lot of human data, do behavioral cloning on that data, create this like, model of, of how a human plays, and then best respond to that human player. Um, in practice, this ends up doing relatively poorly. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. The main reason is that we're kind of like overfitting to the weaknesses in the human data. Like when we create this model of how a human plays, it's not a perfect model because we don't have infinite data. And so there's going to be errors in it, and we're going to overfit to those errors. Um, and we're essentially assuming that we're going to be smarter than the human um, in, in, in the process. Yeah? In the slide before, um, what would you say, which games have, or what, what does the game have to have to have a lot of opportunity for cooperation? Uh, that's a tricky thing. Like, how do you def how do you measure the level of cooperation in a game? I, I think there has been some work on this actually, but I don't know um, what the state of the art is for that. Yeah. Okay, so you don't want to go all the way in the other direction of of just doing behavioral cloning and then best responding to that. And what we actually ended up arriving at in diplomacy is something in between, where we do uh, this algorithm called Pickle. And uh, basically, Pickle is doing self play RL. But there is a KL penalty for deviating from uh, the human data policy. So we train a policy uh, through behavioral cloning of human data. And that gives us this model of how humans play the game. And then during self-play, we're going to do basically like regular self-play, except we have a penalty for deviating from the human policy. So we're encouraging the policy to stay close. Uh, we're encouraging the self-play policy to stay close to the human policy. Um, this has actually been done in many prior works.
Um, one example would be um, AlphaStar from, from DeepMind. Um, and it, it's, it actually works surprisingly well for self-play RL in a general sum game. Um, now we have this like parameter lambda that controls how much we regularize to the human policy. So if lambda is set to zero, then this is identical to doing self-play RL from scratch with no human data. We're just ignoring the human policy completely. If we set lambda to infinity, then that is just identical to behavioral cloning. We're essentially ignoring the expected values of actions and just doing um, the, pol the human policy. But if we find that for like an appropriately tuned lambda in between those two extremes, we actually get the benefits of both. Any questions? OK. Um, now, uh, I think we, I, I forget the number. I think it was like 0.1 or something. Um, and it actually, I guess this answers your question. It was actually a distribution, interestingly enough. So, OK, what is, what is Pickle doing? It is essentially giving you a better model of how humans are playing. It's not really about making yourself better. It's about better modeling the other players. Um, and so when we ourselves are playing, like when our agent is playing, we don't need to play like a human. We just need to understand how humans play. So we can play basically with a much lower lambda ourselves than the other players. Um, like, you can imagine that if you could perfectly model the humans, then you could just do single agent RL and uh, get optimal performance. But, so, by setting the lambda high for the other players and low for ourselves, we're, we're essentially like doing a good job of modeling how humans are playing and then able to best respond appropriately to that. And so that leads to dill pickle. Um, dill pickle is our extension of pickle where we have a distribution over lambdas. So basically on each trajectory of self-play, we're going to sample um, a lambda for each player and then do self-play using that, using that lambda. Um, and so we're going to learn how to respond. Uh, we're going to learn how to play a low lambda policy that's going to like not regularize very heavily to the human policy because the human policy might be suboptimal. Um, but we're still going to learn how to play well with policies that have a high lambda that are playing very similar to how humans play. And you might say, like, well, why not? Why have a distribution at all? Why not just set our lambda to zero and the other players' lambdas to something high? Well, that's because the other players would then assume that we have a low lambda policy. We're going to assume we want the other players to assume that they are playing with human players. And we're still able to best respond given that. So by doing this setup where we have a distribution of lambdas and we're sampling it um, during training, we, we have the other players play as if they're playing, against, playing with a human and we're able to respond under that, um, under that setup. OK, so I'm going to run through the rest of this. Um, results in no-press diplomacy. Um, we found in population experiments with, with AIs that it, this algorithm worked really well. The algorithm is called, the, the bot is called Diplodocus. Um, and we found that it achieves this really strong score even though its prediction accuracy of human moves remains quite high. Um, so the dotted line on the, on the right here is if we just do behavioral cloning on the human data. And Diplodocus high pretty much matches that performance. It just drops a tiny bit. But its score is like 28% of this population of AIs, whereas average would be 14%. And pure supervised learning just gets 6%. Um, we then ran this in uh, a tournament with actual human players. Um, so we played 200 games in a real human tournament. And the bot came in first. Um, even though the players were informed that one player in each game was an AI. And honestly, the players, a lot of the players just wanted to kill the bot. So. <laughs> So they were actively trying to figure out like who is the bot and then try to kill it, but they, they actually weren't able to figure it out most of the time until it was too late. Um, we also have results in Hanabi, so this is on archive. Um, we th this is th these results are a lot noisier because like Hanabi, we just couldn't collect enough data. Uh, but we did find that using this pickle algorithm, we ended up beating human experts by a pretty good margin um, in terms of like playing with a diverse population of human players. Interestingly, just best responding to the behavioral cloning policy also beat expert human players. So this might say that Hanabi was just like too easy of a benchmark in the first place. Um, but we then did a, a more thorough analysis comparing um, Pickle to best responding to the behavioral cloning policy. And we found that indeed it does do better than, than just best responding to behavioral cloning. And finally, we ended up playing this um, 
in a real tournament with human players in full press diplomacy. We placed in the top 10% of players. Um, there was obviously a lot more involved with this than just Pickle, uh, but Pickle did play a major part in, in having this bot be successful. Um, so if you haven't seen that paper, I, I highly recommend checking it out. And again, this is in full natural language diplomacy. So you know, we have the bot playing uh, 40 games, sending an average of 292 messages per game. Uh, and the humans were quite surprised that, that this was actually a bot. They thought it was a human the whole time. OK, uh, I'll skip this because we're running short on time. Uh, there are some questions about why Pickle does well. It's actually not clear to me, and I don't think anybody's really investigated this thoroughly. So if you're looking for research topics, um, I think um, investigating Pickle and understanding why it actually does well would be a really interesting direction for future research. Um, finally, I want to close with like self-play in LLMs, because this is like a hot topic these days. So there's been a question about why self-play hasn't really been successful in games. I think it's partly due to, I, I think one reason is that in games, sorry, there's been a question about why self-play hasn't worked in LLMs despite working so well in games. So in games, we have a great verifier, but a bad generator. Like we know how to score chess, but we don't know how to make an AI that plays chess well. So self-play does really well in that setting. In LLMs, we, we kind of have the opposite setup where we have a great generator. We have trillions of tokens of human text, but we don't have a really good way of scoring, you know, for example, one poem versus another. So self-play, I, I can see being more tricky in that setup. But this may change with time. Uh, I think the amount of reward data that we have is growing, and some domains are easier to score than others. Like I think poetry is a particularly hard domain, but math, for example, might be an easier one. Um, OK, so to recap, in imperfect information games, the value of an action depends on the probability it's chosen. And this is why um, single agent RL algorithms don't work, or perfect information multiplayer RL algorithms don't work in imperfect information games. Um, Self-play with KL regularization towards a behavioral cloning policy, that is Pickle, works really well in general sum games. And you can check out our paper for more our papers for more details. And the code and the models are available at this URL. Um, I highly recommend the using diplomacy as a benchmark for your as a domain for your research. It is um, a relatively inexpensive uh, domain for for doing for investigating moral techniques. Um, we actually didn't use as many GPUs as you might think especially for no press diplomacy. It's actually like quite doable for academics. So highly recommend checking it out. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to talk afterwards. Thanks. OK, so we are running a tiny bit late, but there's some really good questions that came in. So I do think we should just ask a few of those. And then uh, we'll finish at quarter past the hour and starts 15 minutes later, and then just take 15 minutes from lunch, which is an hour and a half anyway, so hopefully that'll be OK. Um, so uh, again, questions in the Slido. Uh, please feel free to vote, add more questions. Uh, I'll start with the one which is top of the list at the moment, um, which is, how might we distinguish between competitive and cooperative behavior in general, or what approaches do you think are most promising for quantifying cooperation? Um, OK, that, that is a tricky one. Uh... So how do we quantify cooperation versus competition? I mean, I think you, I, I was talking to somebody earlier, I forget who it was, but they were saying that like, they were actually doing research on this and they were saying like, you know, measuring the expected value that you get when given the policies of all the players versus like somebody, versus like all the agents best responding and trying to achieve like their optimal payoff is a good way of measuring cooperation. I think that's actually a pretty reasonable way of measuring it. Um, I think there are actually, so there is another l line of research where you, like basically any game can be decomposed into a two player zero sum component and a fully cooperative component. So any general sum game is actually, especially it's easier to think about for two player games, but any two player general sum game can be decomposed into a two player zero sum and fully cooperative component. And so that might be a direction also for measuring the level of cooperation. Like if you, if the two player zero sum component is much larger than the, than the positive sum component then that might imply that it's a more uh, adversarial game. But I don't think it's quite that simple. I have thoughts on this, by the way. So whoever asked that question can come talk to me afterwards as well. Um, next one. Getting nice convergence guarantees in general sum settings is often hard. How important do you think this is for building cooperative AI? Um, it depends on, I, I, think, I think it's pretty important if you have the right setup. So again, like. Having convergence guarantees to something like Nash Equilibrium, if you're not going to play with other copies of yourself, is not useful. Um, if you have 
um, a population, if, if your setup is that you're converging to an optimal policy given some well-principled like population, uh, good estimate of the population of players that you're up against, then I think that is actually quite important. Like that is basically saying like we want perplexity to go down in language models. Like yeah, like, like that's what we want. That's basically the definition of what we want. Cool, thanks. Um, this is a great question. Perhaps you are one of the most appropriate people to be asking this question. What games do you still think uh, do you think still present an interesting challenge for AI? It's a good, good question. question. I've actually been thinking about this. I don't think that there's any any <laughs> recreational games left that would be that interesting. <laughs> Like, I think any game that's left at this point is just because nobody has really put in the effort to try to make an AI that could really beat it. Um, like, you know, Bridge, for example, is still around. Nobody's made a superhuman AI for Bridge, but I think if, you know, we spent six months on it, we could probably do it. It wouldn't be that hard. Um, there is one game I was thinking of that I would still be impressed by if somebody could pull it off, um, and that's the Turing test. So I would love to see a serious effort to make an AI that could win the Turing test against expert humans. Like, you know, it's, it's actually like not crazy at this point, but you could have expert humans that like are the best in the world at detecting whether somebody is a human or an AI, and humans that are the best in the world at you know, trying to convince the judge that they're a human, not an AI. And then if you have an AI that wins that game regardless, that would be pretty impressive. All right, if you're looking for a PhD topic. I think you could just like have an app where you know people play this game where you know one person tries to convince the judge that they're an AI, but both players try to convince the judge that they're they're a human, no and one of them is an AI, one of them is a human. What's that? No further rules. You can try to convince however you want. Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like uh, open-ended natural language dialogue. I'll try and keep questions via the Slido for now, but if you do have a follow-up, feel free to comment on there. Um, Next one, uh, what is strategically different in what we want to do in two-player zero-sum games as opposed to two-team two zero-sum games such as capture the flag, soccer, etc.? What is different? Uh, yeah, what is strategically different in what we want to do is the framing of the question. Um, I don't think there's anything strategically different in what you want to do. I think that um, there is this like added component of like now you have to cooperate between the teammates as well. and um, But that, like... Especially if it's perfect information between the teammates, it's actually quite easy. It basically ends up being a single agent RL problem. Um, if, it's, if it's imperfect information between the teammates, that's like a little bit more difficult, but there are techniques also that like can, can deal with that. Especially if like all the teammates are controlled by the same copy of the agent. If, you're, if you have like a two team zero sum setup where like some of the teammates are humans, then you have a more complicated situation that actually does require um, like I think more than just self player RL from scratch. Cool. Uh, just a couple more quick ones, I think, then, if we've got time. So um, for training cooperative and safe agents, how necessary do you think general sum games are versus many agent zero sum games where, as you said, kind of subsets may interact in a kind of general sum way, forming alliances and so on? I think we definitely want to focus on the general sum aspect. I mean, like, a lot of the complexity comes from the fact that it's general sum, not just like, you know, subsets of two-player zero sum games. Um, yeah, so I think that it's, a, it's important to, to look at, at general sum games, especially for cooperation. Cool, okay. Uh, probably just make this the last quick one. Um, you mentioned Libratus did not rely on neural networks, uh, whereas others such as Rebel, DeepStack, et cetera, do. How do you see the future of game solving uh, with respect to function, appro function approximation? Yeah, I, I think Libratus wasn't successful because it didn't use neural nets. Like Libratus was successful because the real challenge of AI for poker was like kind of an orthogonal question to neural nets. Like neural nets, what they really were able to do well was like function approximation, whereas the challenge in poker was like more of a an RL. Like how do you do RL in an imperfect information game, and how do you do search in an imperfect information game? Um, and so that's why you didn't really need neural nets to be successful at poker. Um, but they're certainly, you know, especially now, like they're helpful. And um, if you want to make a state of the art poker bot that relies as little as possible on domain knowledge, then you probably want to use deep learning. Um, and you know, I think, I think Rebel is probably like the, the best algorithm right now to use for that. Um, but I think that there's, there's more that could be done in that direction as well. OK, cool. That's it for questions. That's all we have time for. So round of applause for now, please.